families and seniors in this country. It's my great pleasure right now to uh, yield, Mr. President, to a champion for women's health care and, and uh, for the state of New Hampshire, uh, Senator Jean Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you. I, I want to commend my colleague, Senator Stabenow, for the great work that she has done over a long period of time for women and families in her state of Michigan and throughout the country. Um, I remember her telling me that she got involved in politics in order to address a nursing home issue, um, which disproportionately affects women, uh, just as this budget that passed the House disproportionately affects women and children. So I'm pleased to be able to join you on the floor and my other colleagues, and I appreciate Senator Mikulski's leadership in bringing us together today. I, there's no doubt that all of us in the Senate and everybody who's spoken on the floor today understands that we need to deal with this country's debt and deficits. There's no question about that. But the question is, are we going to do that in a way that's fair to everyone? And unfortunately, the House Republican plan would disproportionately impact women, in particular older women, because make no mistake about it, the Republican budget that passed the House will end Medicare as we know it today. And since women are a majority of all Medicare beneficiaries, any radical change to the Medicare system will disproportionately affect women, and it will, in the long term, hurt so many women in this country. For example, if we take a typical senior on Medicare in my home state of New Hampshire, under the House Republican plan, that senior's out-of-pocket health care costs are going to double to $12,000 a year. As time goes on, those out-of-pocket costs are going to continue to increase. This health care impact on senior women is especially hard because during most women's working years, they earn less than men. Still true today. Women learn, earn less than men, and women often work part-time or leave the workforce while raising families. As a result, they have less retirement savings on average and lower Social Security benefits. So for women who already have earned less, Medicare is a critical source of financial security. It keeps many women out of poverty. The House passed Republican budget will end that security. And for seniors who rely on prescription drugs, um, a real um, improvement that we made when we passed the Affordable Health Plan um, because we made great progress towards closing that donut hole and helping seniors with their cost of prescription drugs. But what the House Republican plan will do is dramatically increase those costs. Again, in New Hampshire, we have 15,200 seniors who will pay eight and a half million more a year in just one year for their medications. And of course, we all know that women tend to live longer than men. So as a result, women represent three quarters of our most vulnerable Medicare beneficiaries, those who are living in nursing homes, in assisted living or in other long-term care facilities. When their savings runs out, which happens often given the cost of long-term care, seniors must turn to Medicaid to pay the bills. However, the House Republican budget would also make radical changes to the Medicaid system. So their proposal not only threatens Medicare, but it threatens long-term care for millions of women who rely on Medicaid. The House Republican proposal eliminates the current Medicare system and puts private insurance companies in charge of the health benefits that seniors receive. The Republican plan does nothing to reduce the cost of health care. It just shifts that cost of health care onto seniors. And what is going to happen when we shift the cost to seniors who can no longer afford to pay for their health care? They're going to go to emergency rooms. And 
Emergency rooms are not only the most expensive care, because we would have eliminated the preventive care that's part of the new Medicare proposal that we passed for health care, but everybody who has health insurance winds up paying for those emergency room costs that seniors won't be able to afford to pay. So it's a double cost shifting, a shifting to seniors for the cost of their health care and a shifting of those health care costs unto everybody who has insurance. The House Republican budget will hurt all seniors, but it will especially hurt women because they're the most vulnerable. I hope that all of our colleagues will join us in voting against the House Republican budget that is on our desks that we expect to take up this week. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Madam President. The Senator from Connecticut. Thank you, Madam President. I am very pleased and honored to. The House join. is in a quorum call. And may I Senate. Uh, the Senate respectfully the request the suspension of the quorum call? <laughs> Without objection. Uh, Madam President, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to join my colleagues, my distinguished colleagues, most, re most recently yourself, uh, today as we pledge to continue the fight to stand up for women's health care and to fight the devastating cuts that are incorporated in the House Republican budget. This fight against these cuts is essential not only for the health of millions of women across the United States but also for our health care system and even for the effort to cut the debt and the deficit, which has to be one of our most important goals. In the end, these cuts are as far from cost effective as any could possibly be. In the end, they will actually raise the costs of health care in this country because they will deny millions of women and girls preventive health care that saves money in the long run. Preventive health care enables everyone from avoiding the more costly consequences, costly in terms of pain and suffering and worry and concern, as well as in dollars and cents, that come from failure to diagnose and treat problems earlier rather than later. Indisputably, preventive and coordinated health care saves money, and this Republican budget will cost more money. It also will have an impact on states. Unquestionably, in Connecticut, 114,000 people will lose Medicaid if this program is changed into a block grant program, and Connecticut will lose $16.1 billion in health care benefits that will be lost if our government in the state of Connecticut will have to shoulder this greater financial burden. The same will be true of states across the country that will have to bear more of the costs and taxpayers at the state level will pay those costs. Again, as far from cost effective as any program could be. But the real consequences, the most dramatic, and the most immediate effects of this very misguided and cruel 
House Republican budget will be on women and children predominantly because Medicaid and Medicare serve them more than any other part of our population. Medicaid provides in Connecticut, for example, 77 percent of the public funding for family planning. Medicaid pays for 35 percent of all the births in the state of Connecticut. The burden will fall disproportionately and it will have real human consequences for women and children. In a very, very pernicious way, it will also enable and encourage states to wage at their level the kind of ideological war on women's health that we've seen, unfortunately and unconsciously, at the federal level. We can already see the beginnings of it in the state of Indiana, for example, where that state enacted legislation to prohibit Planned Parenthood from receiving Medicaid funds to be used for women's health care. Think of it. Medicaid money cut completely for family planning, for cancer screening, for all kinds of preventive services that constitute the bulk of what Planned Parenthood does in Indiana and across the country under a law that is not only bad public policy, but also illegal. I thank the administration for recognizing the Ill illegality of this law. It has done so in a statement recently issued by the Department of Health and Human Services. It has said unequivocally that this Indiana law that prohibits Planned Parenthood health centers from receiving federal funds for family planning services under Medicaid and Title X contravenes federal law. Now we will ask, and I'm circulating a letter to my colleagues to this effect, the federal government to take action that will provide real teeth for this statement and show that similar laws now pending in other legislatures, such as Kansas and Oklahoma and elsewhere, will also bring compliance action from the federal government. The fact of the matter is, family planning services provided by Medicaid are a mandatory benefit under federal law. Congress created this legal program for beneficiaries in 1972, and it was so concerned about the availability of family planning services that the federal government and this Congress required that they cover 90 percent of all of the cost of services in this area, an unprecedented incentive and a clear signal as to the importance of these services. And so the Indiana law threatens access to vital preventive health care for women millions of women in that state, its precedent threatens the same kind of family planning and preventive care for millions more women across the country. And this body has in effect rejected that kind of restriction by a vote of 58 to 42 when we had to consider the continuing resolution just weeks ago. Let me say finally that this ideological war in Indiana is misguided, it is costly in dollars and in lives, and it should not be tolerated. Certainly it should not be permitted by the kind of approach that's embodied in the House Republican budget, and I believe that the members of this body will take a stand against it and fight the kind of war on women's health care that the House Republican budget so dramatically reflects. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor and I suge suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Mr. President, uh, 